I am a master educator with 19 years of experience. I hold a bachelor degree in education with additional training in gifted education and a master of fine arts degree from the University of British Columbia. I have specialized training in Orton Gillingham, which is an intervention program for children with dyslexia. I have done hundreds of tutoring sessions with the Orton Gillingham method and I am a trained Waldorf educator with 10 years of experience at various Waldorf schools in the U.S. and Canada. Being a parent of two twice exceptional boys, aged 13 and 17, has led me to the work I am currently doing in the field of education. As a new parent 17 years ago, I was already a trained teacher, but I did not yet have experience with the emotional turmoil and strain that having twice exceptional children can bring. Both my children have learning and behavior challenges, as well as profound gifts, that they are still in the process of realizing. They have had big challenges adapting to traditional and non-traditional schools. Meeting their needs and truly seeing them as individuals has been the impetus for my quest for empowering parents in the journey to deliver their children's gifts to the world. Currently, I am living in Los Angeles. I teach at a Reggio-based microschool in Hancock Park and also have my own therapeutic practice teaching foundational literacy skills to twice exceptional children. Before beginning this conversation, I would like to define what it means to be twice exceptional. According to the National Association for the Gifted, twice exceptional children have the characteristics of gifted students with the potential of high achievement and give evidence of one or more challenges. This is a definition that I would like to come back to throughout this presentation. Specific learning disabilities require a clear diagnosis and plan for support. Support is available at school with the implementation of a 504 plan or IEP. As well, support can be done at home with a parent and or with guidance from a skilled professional. Speech and language disorders can range from dyslexia to auditory processing challenges. Again, a diagnosis is extremely helpful here. Emotional behavioral disorders are varied and can range from multiple causes. I suggest first looking carefully at your child's learning and home environment to identify triggers and possible solutions. Physical disabilities can range in type and intensity and may require specific support to work with and overcome. Vision, hearing, fine and gross motor challenges are some examples of disabilities of the children I have worked with. Autism spectrum disabilities can range in intensity and require specific and early intervention. Often other impairments such as ADHD can accompany giftedness in a child. However, be sure to get a second or a third opinion on any diagnosis as evidence shows that there have been many cases of misdiagnosis for gifted children, which can have dire consequences for a child. Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences has been a large part of the discourse of education for the past 20 years. There has been recent criticism that this theory is an oversimplification of potentiality in brain development. We have potential to develop our brains in new directions despite having a dominant intelligence. Research in brain plasticity has revealed that the brain can rewire itself. However, at the same time, Gardner's eight intelligences provide an interesting frame to work with to view giftedness through different lenses besides the stereotypical understanding of academic excellence, which still dominates public discourse around the subject of giftedness. If we observe how our children learn and interact with their environment, we can begin to understand how giftedness can manifest for the twice exceptional child. This helps us begin to understand the whole child and to avoid compartmentalizing or fixing our beliefs for who our children are as individuals. I encourage you to begin to observe your child to identify both her strengths and weaknesses. I've heard many parents of gifted children avoid saying that their child is gifted because they are dealing with feelings of shame and judgment. Saying your child is gifted is not discounting that all children are unique. Every child has unique strengths and talents that are within average developmental milestones. That does not mean they are gifted. 
The definition of gifted means that your child has a synchronous development which overreaches age-appropriate developmental milestones. Teachers' and parents' observations are not the only criteria for determining giftedness. In the classroom, it is not uncommon for expressions of giftedness to be seen as negative behavior challenges. A child's desire to learn outside of the teacher's normative expectations can be seen as oppositional behavior. Saying your child is twice exceptional is a statement that your child has specific needs that are related to specific criteria. It is saying that your child has strengths and challenges that present gaps in development. Learning challenges can overshadow strengths. There are many commonly held beliefs and myths about what it means to be gifted and twice exceptional. These myths exist as commonly held beliefs. They inform our conversation about children and can often obscure children's reality and experiences. To explore and debunk these myths, let's create a story about a hypothetical twice exceptional child named Sarah. Most likely many of you have a daughter like her or have already met a child who reminds you of her. Let's begin our story. A one-dimensional view of the child focuses on the child's challenges and setbacks. Sarah's parents suspected that she may be dyslexic. She routinely had extreme emotional reactions with accompanying physical symptoms. She avoided tasks that were challenging and gave up easily. She did not seem to have a joy of learning the way that her brother had. Since kindergarten, she had yet to make any friends. At home, getting ready for school was a painful process for Sarah and her family. She had difficulty transitioning and would stand at the sink slowly washing her hands in the morning while getting ready for school, while her family waited at the door ready to leave. Her parents and older brother would become fed up and frustrated with her. As well, Sarah's parents observed in kindergarten that Sarah was behind her peers and didn't seem to be learning. She was experiencing high levels of anxiety in going to school. Daily meltdowns were common. As she is a keen observer, she was able to fit in and mimic her peers. And as the program was a play-based one, there was moments of reprieve for her. Grade one was a different story. Which, with heightened expectation came heightened anxiety for Sarah. She was always vigilantly watching her environment and copying her peers. When she worked in her printing workbook, she would cover her right eye with her hand and put her hair over her face. When asked about why she was doing this, she told her teachers it was because there was a shadow around the letters that she was asked to copy. She didn't seem to be learning. Her teachers still said that she would catch up, but her parents began to get a reoccurring nagging feeling that something was not right. What was likely going on? Sarah was using a huge amount of her daily energy to compensate for her challenges. Her parents intuitively knew that something was not right, but the teachers who taught her their daughter did not have adequate training in giftedness and no training in what it means to be twice exceptional. They observed Sarah's vigilance and aggression in the social sphere and told her parents that they were observing Sarah bully her peers. I ask you at this moment to move to a two-dimensional view of Sarah. A two-dimensional view seeks the hidden gifts that lie within a child's challenges. A two-dimensional view is like the two opposite sides of a coin. The official definition of dyslexia from the International Dyslexia Association defines dyslexia as a disability that includes language and auditory processing challenges and can ultimately lead to delayed learning and cognitive development. According to the book The Gift of Dyslexia, dyslexia arises from a lack of neurological fixed orientation. Consider that a hidden gift within dyslexia could be that a lack of fixed orientation could be a potential for flexibility and in problem solving, creativity, and seeing an abstract concept from many potential angles. Many highly sensitive children experience physical symptoms in relation to anxiety. 
They are able to quickly feel empathy and see a situation from another's point of view. High emotional sensitivity points to the strengths of a strong observation skills. Sarah can read her environment and tune into the experiences, intentions, and motives of others. Her challenges show her gifts in the area of inter- and intrapersonal intelligences. Twice exceptional children will go through great lengths and effort to develop skills to compensate for their weaknesses. Avoidance behavior can appear on the surface as a negative behavior. However, if redirected and rechanneled, this behavior is actually a sign of resilience, creative solution making, and innovative problem solving skills. Gifted and twice exceptional children's peer groups are not age specific. Sarah will benefit in counseling through art therapy to develop new ways to initiate with her age peers. A twice exceptional child also has the ability to make friends for different reasons. The idea that children must socialize with children of their own age is an artificial construction. Sarah is good friends with an artist who lives next door to her. She often goes over to her friend's pottery studio and sculpts clay. Her lack of attachment to her own age group has opened up possibilities for other friends and connections. School does not always honor the learning process for children who need to feel completion and who learn through moving into a place of hyperfocus. If we observe a learning environment critically, we can begin to see if space is given to children who take longer to complete tasks. Flexibility in a learning environment leaves space for different learning styles and rates. Sarah's current school experience does not leave her space to finish and complete her work thoroughly. She experiences this as having constant interruptions. At the same time, she will benefit from learning ways to transition more smoothly from one activity to another. Her parents give her lots of time before a transition with verbal heads up, and also she has a predictable routine at home, which gives her comfort and security. A flexible, predictable routine allows children to feel security and also to be aware of parental and school expectations. Now that we understand that a child's unique gifts are seeds of potential, that lie within their challenges, we can begin to explore and debunk commonly held myths that permeate public discourse around the topic of twice exceptionality. Myths reduce the experience of the individual to generalized information. Myths may offer quick, easy to digest information to parents, teachers, and school administrators, but ultimately they obscure the experience of the child and also lead to justifications that may prevent a child from receiving the support they need to thrive and realize their potential contributions to society. We put high expectations on a child who is identified as gifted. Twice exceptional children can be seen as taking valuable school funding and resources that would better help children with only learning disabilities. If he is so smart, why can't he figure it out? This is a common assumption. Twice exceptional children can also be denied IEPs and 504 plans because they score too high on tests. Actions can be taken to address these false beliefs and to fully comprehend your child's needs through seeking support. You can begin this process by visiting your pediatrician to rule out any physical challenges. Once any physical and developmental delays are addressed, take steps to have a full psychoeducational assessment done. You have a right to advocate for your child. Twice exceptional children are also commonly navigating over excitabilities that can manifest in many different ways. The five overexcitabilities are psychomotor, this is commonly thought to mean that the person needs lots of movement and athletic activity, but can also refer to the issue of having trouble soothing oneself for sleep. Sensual. 
Here's the cut the label out of the shirt demand. The child who limps as if with a broken leg when a sock seam is twisted. Also a love for sensory things, textures, smells, tastes, etc. Or a powerful reaction to negative sensory input, bad smells, loud sounds. Imaginational. These are the dreamers, poets, space cadets, who are strong visual thinkers. They use lots of metaphorical speech. Intellectual. This is the most mainstream definition of giftedness, the child genius. These children are highly curious and love to solve problems and puzzles. Emotional. This includes being happier when happy, sadder when sad, angrier when angry. Children with this overexcitability have intensity of emotion. Possible actions to address oversensitivities and excitabilities are to observe your child closely, consult with an occupational therapist if you feel it is needed. An occupational therapist can offer support to adapt both the home and school environment to meet your child's needs. For Sarah, her overexcitabilities manifest in uncomfortable and potentially self-sabotaging ways in the classroom. Sensual sen sensitivity manifests itself for Sarah as a challenge with auditory processing. It is difficult for her to focus and concentrate in a busy environment. She can hear a pencil across the room fall at the same frequency as her teacher speaking to her. This is a layer she has to navigate before she can begin to concentrate and learn. She also experiences strain and frustration in trying to keep up with her peers. She looks at her classmates who just get it and feels defeated before she has begun her day. She compares herself to others and becomes an expert copier to the point where she begins not to trust herself and her own ideas. Sometimes her teacher questions her in front of the class and at this point Sarah wants to become invisible. She will do anything to avoid being seen and called out in this way. Her peers notice all of this and experience her as clingy and, in their words, weird. One day Sarah followed a girl to the bathroom and waited for her outside the stall. The girl didn't like this and told the teacher that it made her feel uncomfortable. Her teacher is at a loss of how to work with this. She doesn't understand what is going on for Sarah. Is any of this familiar to you? Can you see any parallels with your own child's experience? A child who is able to perceive the emotional state of others or social dynamics may not necessarily have the maturity to navigate or cope emotionally. Twice exceptional children have what's known as asynchronous development. That means they may be far ahead intellectually and at the same time far behind socially and emotionally. This gap can cause a lot of anxiety and make it hard for them to get along with their peers. They may also have had a lot of perfectionism around doing things just right. They may come across as argumentative when they really just want to have an in-depth discussion. Reading social cues may not be a skill that a twice exceptional child has had a chance to develop. One morning on the way to school, Sarah saw a homeless man shouting on the street, accusing someone of hurting him. This incident affected her deeply, and she was not able to move past this experience without speaking to her dad and teacher to try to understand this man. She had many questions. Why was he yelling? Who hurt him? She could not effectively process the injustice and suffering that she perceived. This situation led to nightmares, and for the next few weeks she was overly attached to her parents and insecure when her teacher was out of her line of sight. Her anxiety manifested in fearful behavior. Her parents were puzzled to how this small incident had had such a profound effect on her. Possible solutions to a child who has had a high degree of social-emotional asynchrony is to work with a play therapist so that this child can begin to develop strategies and ways to communicate feelings 
and to let go of fears. Although Sarah's parents had chosen a progressive charter school for her to attend, which promoted itself based on educating the whole child, they were left feeling confused and bewildered by her kindergarten and grade one experience. This place of bewilderment was an important part of their journey in fully understanding their daughter's needs and to advocate for her. One day, Sarah's teacher took her mother aside and said in hushed tones that Sarah was being accused of bullying the other girls by other parents, and this was a big problem for the class. This was the final straw for her mother. Instead of reacting as a mother bear would, she calmly took the information in, went home, called Sarah's father, and that day both her parents chose to fiercely trust and believe what their instincts were telling them. This learning environment was not working for their daughter. She was struggling academically, socially, and emotionally, and something had to be done. First of all, they had a meeting with the teachers and administration at Sarah's school. They were told that Sarah would need to wait to be formally assessed, and at present she was achieving at grade level, so there was not an immediate need for her to have an IEP or 504 plan. Next, they visited Sarah's pediatrician, where they ruled out any physical challenges that she may be having associated with learning. Despite the school's advice, they scheduled a psychoeducational assessment, which determined that Sarah had dyslexia, dyscalculia, and auditory processing issues. They knew that Sarah would qualify for an IEP or 504 plan with this new diagnosis, but they felt in their hearts that it was a little too late. As the school year was coming to an end, they made a big leap and chose to withdraw her from the charter school and put her into a micro school, a type of homeschooling program with two licensed teachers, with a low four to one student teacher ratio. They hired an educational therapist who did two lessons per week in direct intervention. Immediately, Sarah's anxiety was reduced. She became more outgoing and bubbly and surprisingly had a noticeable growth spurt. Best practices in gifted education require teaching to the child's strengths. It is not straightforward to make this happen for the twice exceptional child. If we consider Sarah's strengths, they are encompassed in her areas of oversensitivity. She has abundant empathy for others, a high level of observation and perception skills, the ability to focus fully on a topic that interests her, and aesthetic sensitivity. Her parents realized that an either-or approach was not going to work for their child. They had correctly determined that she was developing avoidance compensatory skills and falling through the cracks in her former school environment. However, they also saw that she had a high potential in her areas of giftedness. Her struggles to learn language, reading and writing, were impeding her development. Her psychoeducational assessment report revealed that along with moderate dyslexia, auditory processing, and passive attention deficit, she was also gifted with a high vocabulary, comprehension, and visual acuity. Her parents realized that if her gifts were continually blocked, she would lose an interest in learning, and she would be at risk for developing more severe learning and behavioral difficulties. Solutions for the twice exceptional child do not differ from what are best practices in gifted education. Twice exceptional children deserve and require the same opportunities to develop their potential as gifted and non-gifted children. Best practices in gifted education should be primarily the driver in any plan. Intervention ideally should be targeted and results oriented. A twice exceptional child should not under any circumstances be required to spend the majority of his time at school in a special education program focusing on remediation. I have asked you to imagine that what appears as your child's disability or disorder may in fact be a veiled strength, that if nurtured, supported, and understood is the path for transformation and growth. If you create a picture of your child in this way, 
you open up the possibility to change the paradigm and to see your child from a new perspective. If you advocate for your child from this place, you also have the potential to transform yourself as a parent. The one-dimensional view of the twice-exceptional child is a focus on the child's weaknesses. A two-dimensional view of the twice-exceptional child is a focus on the hidden strengths hidden within the child's challenges. A three-dimensional view of the twice-exceptional child is your place as a parent within the picture. Your support, intervention, and love for your child are the most powerful influences in her life. You can make a big difference beyond anything else. A three-dimensional view of the child starts with the pursuit of creativity. Creativity is the place where learning begins. The qualities and attributes that both gifted and twice exceptional children possess cannot be generalized. However, one quality that I have observed over and over again in my work and which can manifest in infinite ways is creativity. In her previous school, Sarah was already beginning to tune out. She was underachieving at a young age. For programs to be engaging and interesting for both gifted and twice exceptional children, there needs to be the opportunity for experimentation with different materials and topics, collaboration with intellectual peers, and the opportunity to work hard to overcome challenges and to experience failure in a way that can build grit and resilience. Divergent learning is a creative impulse with multiple possibilities. The twice exceptional child should be given appropriate challenge and learning opportunities. Learning through creativity is the sole food of the twice exceptional child. We live in a hurry-up culture that does not leave much space for daydreaming or ruminating on ideas. Early learning has become outcome-oriented. Educational environments can be top-heavy with convergent thinking. Convergent thinking shows up with worksheet-heavy tasks, a focus on right and wrong answers, conclusion-based thinking, early academic push, and skill and drill. This kind of approach without divergent problem-solving opportunities encourages children to prune their thinking. Children can realize early on that there is no benefit for them in asking questions. To reach and support the twice exceptional child, parents and educators can begin to observe where divergent thinking is present in a learning environment. Divergent thinking lives in an environment where there are opportunities to explore ideas such as opportunities for play at all ages, and exploration of hands-on materials and project-based learning for collaboration with others and flexibility in the environment. Twice exceptional children tend to be dominant divergent thinkers. They start with an idea and move towards multiple possibilities and outcomes. This thinking style is based on direct observation and abstract thinking. Divergent thinking is the first step in creating an innovative concept, design, or solution. Convergent thinking is the opposite and follows the traditional model of deductive reasoning. Ultimately, these thinking styles work best when they balance each other. The job of the parent and educator is to support the child in navigating this process and to become aware of his or her thinking patterns. This awareness allows a creative person to step back and evaluate a process. As adults, we provide the strengths of convergent thought to the highly divergent thinking patterns of the twice exceptional child. In the previous slide, I spoke about thinking styles. In this slide, I will relate thinking to learning. Convergent learning encourages children to find one answer to a problem. Divergent learning encourages children to create multiple outcomes and solutions. Sarah's new school was Reggio-inspired. The foundation of Reggio education is that children are natural researchers. 
It is an inquiry-based education where children have agency in their learning. It is constructivist learning, which emphasizes solutions for real-world problems fueled by children's interests and passions. Demonstrating understanding in multiple ways is also a big part of this educational philosophy. There are many educational philosophies and practices that can meet the needs of the twice exceptional child. You know your child best. Go and observe with a critical eye to see that whatever learning environment that you choose for your child has many opportunities to develop divergent thinking abilities. Ultimately, even though a twice exceptional child has the propensity towards divergent thinking, Convergent thinking is also an important piece of the puzzle. An adult who is tuned in to the child's strengths and weaknesses can provide this balance. As a parent, you can nurture and support your child to develop divergent thinking skills through a creative, open-ended process. Determining the outcome of the process of inquiry is where convergent learning plays an important role. Gifted and twice exceptional children benefit from a learning environment that gives opportunities and space to develop both modalities of thinking. If we see our brain as a blender that is creating something new, we can visualize that this is done through pulses of divergent and convergent problem solving. Gifted and twice exceptional children have a natural propensity for this. They put their brains into a bilateral mode. Teaching a child to be aware and conscious of their own thinking is important. When children can begin to articulate and express their own learning process, they develop the metaconsciousness to be independent thinkers. The twice exceptional child needs a team-oriented plan with parents at the helm. I have learned through trial and error that intervention needs to be properly pre-assessed to create a specifically targeted plan of action. Needs identified in the pre-assessment process are the basis of any plan. Intervention works best with regularly scheduled short lessons. These lessons should be paired with opportunities to develop gifts through creative outlets. Children need to engage all of their senses in the learning process. Any intervention should be cumulative and based on mastering concepts to promote a child's success and confidence. The three-dimensional approach to parenting your twice exceptional child is the ultimate goal to create a strong ongoing network of support. You are at the center of your child's life. You are the captain of the ship on this sometimes challenging journey that at times can seem impossible to navigate. Do whatever it takes for you to fulfill this role. Often parents can feel isolated when they are faced with the task of advocating for their children. Find your community online or in a specialized educational program where parents with similar experiences to you gather and connect. Consider yourself the protector of the mission to support your child to develop their potential to thrive. You are helping your child deliver his gifts to the world. This is not a small task. You are in it for the long game. Often twice exceptional children feel misunderstood as their gifts are masked by their challenges. You may be asking, how do I connect with my child to meet her needs? Before any solution is considered, first connect at an emotional level with your child on a frequent, repetitive basis. Children are open and receptive when they feel truly seen and understood. A starting place is to re recognize that children carry questions. Consider these questions as a place to start when building an authentic attachment with your child. Do you see me? Do you understand me? Can you see my point of view and what interests me? Do you care about me? The child's questions are based in an emotional need to belong, and when a child feels seen, he can begin to let go and even risk failure. 
The fear of failure can cause him to avoid learning at all costs. Trust needs to be in place before learning can take place. Stay sane on your journey. Create healthy routines in your child's life. Create less clutter in her environment. With the risk of sounding like a cliche, less is more. Accept that there will be challenges and don't be discouraged. Support is out there. If you can keep the long game in mind, your child will reap the rewards of your commitment. Keep boundaries and expectations for your child. She needs this from you. Remember to breathe, literally. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Believe in yourself and your child equally. You got this. Here are some resources. Please email me if you would like more information or if you have any questions. Thank you for generously giving your time. I really appreciate it. I look forward to meeting you in the future at one of the community events. Good luck.